Hi all, this is Will Trackman, Associate General Counsel with Mountain States Legal Foundation. We are excited to have you all here today for our webinar, 100 Days of Havoc, the first 100 days of the Biden administration. I have two distinguished guests and colleagues with me here today, and I wanna introduce them, and then we will just jump into the discussion to talk about the first 100 days of the Biden administration. First, I want to introduce David McDonald, an attorney with Mountain States, and a graduate of Columbia Law School in 2016, and one of my distinguished colleagues. Hello. Next, I want to introduce Cody Wisniewski, who is the director for the Center to Keep and Bear Arms, and also one of my colleagues at Mountain States Legal Foundation, a graduate of the University of San Diego Law School. I was going to say, John. I thought maybe it wasn't Columbia, so we had to like wait to introduce my law school. <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> graduate of a law school. Yes. <laughs> next time, I will introduce Cody first, just to make sure that he doesn't follow Columbia Law School. <laughs> but uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We are excited to have a robust discussion about the first 100 days. As you've probably seen, media reports uh, have mentioned that the Biden administration has uh, engaged in radical normalcy, that uh, the first 100 days are refreshing in scope and honesty. But here we want to talk about the brass tacks of what has happened in the first 100 days. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, David and Cody uh, Cody, let's start with you. What are your broadest impressions of the first 100 days of the Biden administration? Oh, man, I think the title Havoc kind of gives away where we're <laughs> going with this. I, <laughs> I think we might have tipped our hand. Um, for me, it's really shown just something we've realized recently is kind of the growth of the administrative state. And something that we've become very cognizant of is the idea of how much power agencies have over our lives. And I think the first 100 days of the Biden administration have really demonstrated that. Instead of looking to push certain things through Congress, even though the Democrats control um, you know, both the um, House and the Senate, things have really moved through the agencies. There, there were a record number of executive orders, and there's been a record number of rulemakings and, and pushing things through these agency powers. And so I think the, the growth, the size, and then the what I would call the abuse of the administrative state has really been the first 100 days under this administration for me. Interesting. Um, David, go ahead. First off, thank you, Will, for immediately setting the audience against me. Uh, <laughs> but I think I would have to agree with, with Cody in that the, the emblematic moment, I think, for the first 100 days would be either the first or second day of office, uh, President Biden uh, sent a letter to his heads of departments of the agencies, giving them instructions on how they should prioritize uh, their their work and how they should view their responsibilities. Um, that uh, letter to the agencies informed them that they needed to uh, actively promote regulation and that they needed to take into account the unquantifiable benefits of regulation. Um, so, and I think that's just, I think that's emblematic of a kind of a shift in tone, a shift in focus for this administration that again was really not at all what Biden was, was elected on. It seems like a real kind of bait and switch to a lot of us. Yeah. Well, let's talk more about uh, the appointments in the agency because a lot of us are familiar with some of the higher level cabinet selections. And even below that, there are some selections for um, the sub agencies. So, you know, the offices within the agencies that have been more on the, on the radical side. Uh, Cody, do you want to start talking about appointments and feel free to take that question with high level appointments or low level appointments? Yeah, I think there's two high level appointments that really stood out for me. Um, both just in general, but also from the realm of, of gun rights and from the realm of what we're going to see coming out of this administration and their treatment of uh, the individual's natural right to self-defense as protected by the Second Amendment. And that's Garland and that's Becerra. So Garland was obviously nominated and appointed as the Attorney General. Uh, Xavier Becerra was appointed as the head of the Department of Health and Human Services. And these, so Garland is famous for his... Uh, nomination and inaction towards the Supreme Court, which has now paid off in the form of being an AG. Uh, the AG. The AG. Not uh, the AG. <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> and Becerra was famously the Attorney General of California for a very long time. There are quite a few Second Amendment lawsuits that read so-and-so v. Becerra. Um, and he was he's kind of a career politician. He entered into politics literally before I was born. So these two guys being moved into these agencies is a huge indication of what the administration is looking at doing with a lot of things, but also with gun rights. And I think 
their nominations, you're going to see gun rights being treated as, or guns being treated as a health issue. Uh, Biden's called it an epidemic in his open, one of his opening press conferences. These two gentlemen have parroted that line as well. And so what people don't realize is that the Department of Health and Human Services has the largest budget of any department in the United States. Um, that budget is $1.4 trillion. By comparison, the Department of Defense, which most people think is the most funded, only has a budget of about, <laughs> only, has a budget of about $704 billion, which is just, is literally half of Health and Human Services. So if you see, now a lot of what Health and Human Services has is non-discretionary, but I think you're going to see those funds being marshaled in a way to, like David said, I mean, they're prioritizing more regulation. They're prioritizing more involvement of these agencies in your life. And that's a lot of money to fund uh, involvement in your life. So I think keeping an eye on Garland, who's now controlling the litigation and legal position of the administration, and keeping an eye on Becerra, who has this large budget and has kind of been a career member of the, the political party, I think are going to be major ones to watch out for in the form of challengeable litigation or challengeable rules for us going forward. Yeah. So, so Merrick Garland, um, that's someone I think a lot of people are probably familiar with because he was obviously nominated for the Supreme Court by Barack Obama, um, often described as a sort of a lawyer's lawyer, kind of a, a good, respected Washington kind of guy, uh, centrist, moderate, has been thrown out a lot. What is the issue with Merrick Garland from, from a kind of conservative or libertarian perspective? Yeah, so my big concern with Garland is, so obviously we have a lot of record of him as being a judge. He was a judge on the D.C. Circuit, which is the mini Supreme Court. Um, and so we've seen his judicial philosophy. And you would think in most instances that a judicial philosophy would be a lot more restrained than a political philosophy or even an attorney's philosophy, because he's trying to sit as the independent moderator as opposed to setting policy, as opposed to making arguments. And a lot of his decisions at the DC circuit are very much in favor of the administrative state, even as a neutral arbitrator. So seeing somebody that has consistently um, protected or decided in favor of agency power is what gives me a lot of concern there. He was, what I would say, he was bad on the Second Amendment issue while he was a judge. I think that, or I think that he ruled improperly on certain Second Amendment cases that were, were before him or in the DC circuit. So really that willingness to sign off on the administrative state as a judge mm -hmm. tells me or, or indicates for me that that is only going to grow with him as attorney general, which means the litigation positions that they're going to push and the legal positions that they're going to push as the administration are going to be even stronger than those in his opinions. Hmm. David, I want to turn to you uh, on the appointments issue. Before I do that, I want to uh, welcome everyone who joined us a few minutes late. Uh, we're here with the Mountain Heights Legal Foundation and two of my colleagues discussing President Biden's first 100 days, 100 days of havoc. And there is a uh, Q&A button. If you are interested in submitting a question and getting involved in the conversation, we would love to hear your thoughts and love to have your insightful questions. So please feel free. Uh, go ahead and submit those questions now. We will be taking them toward the, toward the end, but we want to get your thoughts as uh, our remarks uh, occur. So uh, David, let me turn it to you. We have discussed the topic of um, appointments with respect to guns. What are your thoughts on some of the early appointments, either cabinet level or lower level folks who have been appointed by the by the president? Yeah, so I've worked a lot uh, more recently on kind of public lands, natural resources, environmental type work. So I'd like to highlight uh, Biden's pick to head the Department of the Interior. That's Deborah Halland. Uh, Deborah Halland, uh, if you're not aware, was a uh, freshman congressperson from New Mexico, uh, elected in 2018 as part of that cohort. Um, who was recently named the Department of the Interior. And I think this is another very problematic choice uh, as a cabinet level secretary, because for the first, I mean, firstly, she's not particularly experienced. Um, this is something that always comes up um, with kind of political nepotism saying, oh, these are political donors or, or business friends or something. Um, in her case, she was a, a political friend, political ally of the president and the party. Um, 
kind of chosen as part of this sort of Andrew Jackson style spoil system of you bring in your, your friends when you make appointments. And normally, and that's sort of business as usual politicking. There's nothing particularly surprising about that. The problem with Secretary Halland is that she brings in that with a extreme radical kind of left-wing perspective on politics. It's, it's, she's not just some backbencher in Congress who's good at raising money. She's coming into this with an agenda, with an idea of what she wants to do. Uh, she's come out in favor of the Green New Deal, um, basically the destruction of Americans, both their, their livelihood through uh, extractive industries and also to eating meat and all those types of things. Um, she's come out for that. She's supported a complete and total fracking ban. Um, so she she brings a lot of problems to this in, in, into the problem with natural resources that I think is emblematic of a larger problem with the Biden administration generally. Yeah, I'm curious. What do you think? So the elephant in the room here, right, is the interaction between the federal government and the tribes, and and how do you think that Holland's appointment in Interior, which has the Bureau of Indian Affairs underneath it, how do you think that's going to affect the Fed's interaction with the tribes on? these vast swaths of federally managed lands. Yeah. It's, it's very good for, for, for tribal members um, in that they get some, uh, they're, they're likely to get more participation, more involvement in making these decisions. The unfortunate thing is that this uh, openness doesn't seem to be extending to other stakeholders. Uh, obviously, you want the federal government to involve uh, the local people who is who's actually going to affect. That's very important. We want local control over things as much as possible, and uh, that involves the Indian tribes, but it also involves state and local governments. And what we've seen uh, from the state and local governments, especially out in the Mountain West, where we are, is that a a positive working relationship had developed with the prior administration of the last few years of uh, respecting local interests, local concerns. And there's been a lot of fear and trepidation because they haven't really been getting that recently. Um, so I think there's, it's important to make sure you involve the tribes because they are important stakeholders, but it's also important not to forget the other stakeholders. And I think you can see this down the list of appointments is you see a lot yeah. of, um, heads and lawyers from environmentalist organizations, activist organizations, civil rights organizations. You see a lot of government lawyers. You see a lot of uh, a fair number of, of the general kind of big law New York lawyers <laughs> as well. But there's almost no representative from producers at all. And I think yeah. that's that's really telling. Interesting. Yeah, my experience, I think, is similar to yours. I'll add a little, I'll add a little bit of color here, which is that uh, before I was at Mountain States, I was at the Department of Education. Uh, and the department enforces Title IX of the 1972 Education uh, Amendments Act, which protects students from sex discrimination. And uh, the department interpreted that provision to bar, for instance, um, transgender athletes who were born male but identified as female from competing and winning uh, tournaments in Connecticut. And now the superintendent of Connecticut is the secretary of education. So the person who was the very target of the Department of Education's enforcement action is now in the lead seat. So that's something that the Biden administration has done effectively, uh, which has turned some of the, the folks who were litigating against the agency to be now inside the doors. Uh, and the call is coming from inside the house in, in that regard. Well, thank you gentlemen for um, that answer. I want to talk a little bit about the media portrayal of President Biden being a moderate, uh, you know, perhaps coming into office on a mandate of returning back to normal times, to people not worrying so much about what the, the president is doing. And on the other hand, what the first 100 days have actually meant uh, in terms of policy changes. So, David, I'm going to start with you this time. What are the, aside from the appointments, what are the things we've actually seen occur in the first hundred days uh, that have um, caused you some concern? Yeah, so the things that have really gotten me are the early executive orders we see because there's, like Cody Which mentioned- Which one? There's a hundred. There, there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, not a whole lot of policy has actually gotten into place yet. The federal government is not a swift moving beast. But I think uh, one of the major issues is that right out of the gate, uh, you wish, he issued a call for a moratorium on oil and gas leasing. 
um, which was sold as a sort of, oh, it's, it's a 30 day pause. We're just gonna reevaluate things are, but you have millions of people who are gonna be impacted by higher energy prices, people who are affected by, the, uh, they acquired leases, they put all the work into acquiring a lease, they paid for a lease, all of a sudden they can't act on this anymore. Uh, you have regulatory uncertainty, people know what their investments are going into. We have no idea when any, if ever, oil and gas is ever gonna be taken out of American soil ever again. Yeah. Um, so I think that was initially, uh, we're gonna have to see how exactly that gets implemented going forward, but we've seen the announcement of the policy already and that's been that's been very disturbing. Um, I think that's that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, we've heard, heard rumblings about uh, how Biden uh, potentially intends to abuse the Antiquities Act to get around Congress, uh, locking up even more land, um, his, his plan to I think what was his plan? Lock up 30% of America's land, America's land uh, by 2030, uh, without any indication of how that's going to be yeah. gotten, um, willingly or not willingly. Uh, I, I, so we, I think we've seen a general, a general um, refusal to take into account the concerns of the people on the ground who are actually working. On yeah, it's the the central planning, right? It's the idea of you know the federal government knows best. They have the experts. The experts will tell you what's good for you. They don't. They don't need your input, David. Yeah. It's it's very adorable that you think that <laughs> y- your input is relevant to your life. But uh, the Biden administration no- knows best. Yeah. So you know the their experts in their field can kind of tell you. I think that's a really interesting kind of shift that we're seeing. Yeah, the the expansive use of expertise. Um, only unfortunately, expertise never sends to to stay within its lane of of where the expertise truly lies. Unfortunately, and that's I think that's something we've seen in the last year, especially. Yeah. Well, well, Cody, I've I've heard recently that no amendment is absolute, uh, <laughs> and so I I think President Biden made that comment with respect to the Second Amendment, uh, and he used the example of the First Amendment not being able to shout fire in a crowded theater. Um, so tell me. Um, I want to talk about what's going to happen uh, in a second, but before we get there, can you talk to me about what's already happened in the first hundred days? Yeah, absolutely. So yes, we had a uh, now infamous press conference dealing with the Biden administration's position on gun rights in which he talked about amendments not being absolute. It's interesting. We're at the point now where in our lives, the burden is completely shifted. People no longer recognize that the federal government is a government of enumerated powers. We, we told them what they can do. We also told them what they can't do. Article one, section eight, nine, and 10 talks about what the federal government can do, what they can't do, and then what the states can't do. And the amendments were crafted to reinforce the protection on individuals' rights. You have these rights, and they were just merely confirming that the government couldn't do so. So this idea that we rely solely upon the second amendment for our right to keep and bear arms is just inaccurate. It's the same thing with speech and the same thing with right to privacy and and to be secure in your papers. Those are rights that you have as a human being. And we have affirmatively told the government that they cannot infringe upon those rights. You didn't suddenly get a first amendment right to speech on uh, September 17th, 1787. (laughs) Exactly. And, and it's something that the Supreme Court has recognized. This isn't some crazy niche position. This is a, a active understanding of how our rights are, how our rights exist and how our government was formed. So that, that's where this amendments are an absolute kind of garbage really plays in. But at that the worst metaphor in human history as well. Uh, used the worst possible case. Could you pick a worse case too? For, for those of you who aren't aware, the you can't yell fire in a crowded theater that quote comes from a supreme court decision in which the supreme court said it's okay to jail anti-war protesters yeah it wasn't really a pro speech case. <laughs> yeah <No. laughs> um and so getting to your actual question will uh, about what the administration has done so they've started to push where they think they can push on gun rights and this is what i was kind of talking about at the beginning and this is marshalling the power of the administrative state so instead of trying to, to pass an executive order banning certain firearms or just to try and, you know, force uh, so-called universal background checks, what the Biden administration did was announce that they were going to undergo a rulemaking to determine the legality and the, the classification of what we what the industry, firearms industry calls 80% lowers. And, and basically, these are objects that are 
not firearms. They do not meet the federal definition of firearms and thus can't be regulated as such. But a lot of people have referred to these as ghost guns, which is a just a ridiculous moniker that's only meant to be derisive. And the Biden administration is going to marshal the rulemaking process to try and force the federal government to regulate things that statutorily it has no authority to regulate. Um, and you're going to see that with, he announced that also with pistol braces, which is, again, something that the federal government, it's, it's because of their own ridiculous definitions and regulations of firearms that these things are even in the, the media. But um, you're going to see the Biden administration, or we are seeing, sorry, the, the Biden administration push on the administrative side rather than pushing on the forced executive order side. And I think that's why a lot of people are, are somewhat frustrated of why there hasn't been more legal action against the Biden administration early on, as it mm. seemed to be so much against the Trump administration. And one of the reasonings is one, um, we make sure that when we litigate cases, they're based on a principled manner and that we're enforcing something and that there is actually a order to litigate against. Novel concept. I know, right? How dare we be principled in our actions? Um, which is sarcasm, folks. We are always principled in our actions. <laughs> you got, you got the, the transcript won't read. There's no sarcasm, Mark. <laughs> um, but what you're seeing is a lot of posturing. You're seeing a lot of, oh, we're going to undergo a rulemaking. We're going to take into account climate justice. You haven't seen a lot of real action. And where there is action, you have seen lawsuits, and those are where they're coming from. But there's been a lot of, of grandstanding. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with both of you. You know, one thing I've noticed that the, is, the, is that they've spent a lot of time undoing some of the, the best things that, uh, that occurred under President Trump. So uh, and when I was still there, we issued a series of documents and webinars uh, about schools not being able to overuse race uh, in the classroom. So you can't assign students different uh, courses or different grades or different materials based on race. You can't uh, engage in wildly um, race, uh, wild stereotypes about race. And within a few weeks, those documents were uh, withdrawn as contrary to the equity uh executive order that came out at the end of January. So if, if those uncontroversial types of statements are contrary to equity, then I think we have a, a real problem. And at the same time, we've seen a lot of signposting about what's going to come in the future. So reevaluating uh, regulations that were passed under the Trump administration to increase due process on campus. Uh, those sorts of things are signposts for the future that have happened and that indicate that um, there are dark clouds ahead. Well, yeah, Will, Will yeah. got to plug us a little bit at the beginning, and I'd say Will did a really interesting brief on this in the Students for Fair Admission case, right? That's right. Um, yes. That yeah. was about kind of the, the former administration's um, position on these issues and how much thought and work went into the rulemaking, which took years, right? I think it so on Title IX, where we were trying to address some of the deficiencies in due process on campus, uh, the department withdrew in 2017, September 2017, two very uh, troubling and problematic letters that the Obama administration had issued in 2011 and then in 2014. But it took us another two and a half years to finally codify what the Trump administration's approach would be. So it took all the way from September of 2017 to May of 2020 to actually codify what we were going to do into law. The Obama administration had no qualms about issuing what were called dear colleague letters or just administrative letters to all school districts saying, hey, you better read what we're saying or your federal funds and your scholarships are in jeopardy. Yeah, and well, that, yo, go ahead. And that, that just brings me to that's an issue that I think has been kind of accelerated during the Biden administration, but is far from new. We've been talking about the surprising aspects of the first 100 days. And unfortunately, I think this is something that's really accelerated over the past three or four administrations where yeah. uh, I can't even name the last, I can't, what's, what's the last statute you can think of that was less than a half a trillion dollars of spending? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like we, they don't do legislation more. So we have this sort of, um, Will, Will just mentioned that they were working on repealing and replacing a 2011 guidance by the Obama administration that's now been uh, 
rescinded and overturned by the Biden administration. And I'm sure there's going to be a new one when the new guy comes in, a new girl comes in later. And we have this kind of whiplash effect here where the presidents are, are setting policy through executive order, through proclamation, through uh, the administrative state. Through the, yeah. And you realize this situation where it's every four to eight years, you have every person in America wondering, is my business legal anymore? Is what I'm, what I want to do with my life legal anymore? Yeah. And it's, it's a really, really a, a growing problem across the board. Yeah. So uh, just some minor issue is that because those regulations were enshrined in not statute, but regulation, it's going to take some additional time for Biden to attack uh, campus due process. And if you want to read more about that, you can visit <laughs> us at mslegal.org. All of our briefs are online. Will's brief included under the Students for Fair Admissions case. So you can read up. It's a really accessible brief. I think he did a really great job on it and just really presenting the process that was undergone, right? It's, it's, we're not picking sides here. We're not playing teams. We're, we're principled. We will litigate against whomever if they violate our founding principles. And this wasn't a question of, oh, well, you know, the Trump administration had it right. And the, there were, because it was the Trump administration, this was the administration underwent a significant amount of research and work to ensure that it was appropriately applying and protecting individual rights. And so um, I think it's a really accessible example of, of us being able to take that position. Yeah, so we've talked about what we've seen in the first 100 days. Uh, actually, as a reminder, I want, I want to uh, remind our audience that the uh, Q&A box is open. If you'd like to submit a question, uh, please do so. We are taking... Uh, questions from the audience. We would like to hear your thoughts and uh, have you get involved in the conversation. So we've talked about what has happened in the first 100 days. Now I want to talk about, uh, again, the dark storm clouds ahead of us. <laughs> what have you taken from the first 100 days that gives you an inference, maybe a little bit of speculation about what's going to happen over the next three plus years David, do you want to do you want to start on this one? Yeah, I think I'd start by saying, like I've like I said earlier, we've been hearing rumblings uh, about the Antiquities Act, and uh, President Biden did issue an executive order early on in his presidency, uh, ordering his agencies to uh, look at the monument designations and look at the the restrictions that uh, President Trump made on the especially the the Utah monuments, the Grand mm -hmm. Staircase and Bears Ears. Do you want to take a step back and walk us through what happened and then what, what you're anticipating to happen? And what the Antiquities right. Act. Right. So the Antiquities yeah. Act of 1906, <laughs> uh, a statute that was it was created by Congress uh, around the turn of the century specifically to uh, protect Native American archaeological sites in the American Southwest that had been recently uh, looted by people um, coming in off the new railroads. To protect antiquities. Specific antiquities, archaeological sites. Yeah, the Antiquities Act. <laughs> and... Uh, it was originally passed because the idea was these sites were getting discovered and looted before Congress had the opportunity to pass a law to protect them. So they thought, OK, let's give the president some limited authority to uh, protect small, specific, discrete areas uh, until we can get around to more permanent legislation. So that's what the Antiquities Act was originally intended to do. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been what it was intended to do for a very <laughs> long time. And uh, so, for example, in the first 100 years when it was existence from 1906 to 2006, a uh, total of 70 million acres were, were withdrawn using that act. Um, 700 million acres have been withdrawn since then. <laughs> So we've seen an explosion of its use. And really what it is is basically a, a president, and we've seen this both Clinton and Obama, and I think we can likely see this with Biden uh, in the future, um, wanted to establish national parks, um, which nothing wrong, I love my national parks, but they wanted to protect for its kind of general environmental reasons, aesthetic reasons, kind of protect the landscape for our posterity, which is, which is fine, Cong Congress has that power. Um, but Congress didn't do that because Congress understands that people actually live and people actually work on this land. And they recognize that the locking this away from any sort of development would really, really harm a lot of Americans. Mm -hmm. um, undeterred, these presidents just decided to do it on their own volition anyway. So these are basically stealth national park uh, designations, um, pretending to be national monument designations, 
uh, locking up millions of acres in Utah. Um, and it's really devastated the local local communities. So that's that's the Antiquities Act. That's what that we're talking about here. And so far, we, we've gotten inklings that uh, the Biden administration will be likely to use the Antiquities Act in a yeah. very expansive way going forward. Because again, uh, it allows you to avoid the time and expense of trying to convince America's representatives to vote for something. Yeah. How dare we convince the people that actually represent Americans to, you know, have an opinion on them? Much like, you know, the local issue doesn't matter. Well, just as much as local concerns and whatnot are less important, even your local representative is is less important. That's or, your second use of sarcasm. I'll give you one more. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. Well, that's and, and, and we and Mount St. Louis <laughs> Foundation represents uh Kane and Garfield counties, mm-hmm. the counties in southeast U- Utah where these monuments are located. And if you talk to, the, to these people, you get a, a sense of the federal government didn't ask them when they put these in. Yeah, They came in and told them, this is what's going to go on. You're going to have to deal with it. And then when President Trump came into office and he issued his, uh, his uh, proclamations uh, limiting the sizes of those monuments, he created a dialogue with the local officials, with yeah. the local stakeholders. And that more than anything was really the thing that they felt was lost. Um, and that's yeah. what they're very concerned about is we're not getting that anymore. Wasn't the initial announcement of the expansion done like way away from the site because it was so unpopular? That was back in 1996, okay. the, the creation of the Grand Staircase Escalante uh, National Mall, Escalante, sorry. <laughs> uh, as, as, a, as a native Nevadan, I get very angry when people pronounce it wrong. Uh, but that was in 1996. This is in Utah. Uh, the, the announcement was actually on the rim of the Grand Canyon because Clinton, I believe, uh, don't, quote me on this, but I believe he was actually being burnt in effigy oh, <laughs> at the actual site at the time. So yeah, so you, again, theater over yeah. benefits. So the net then is the Obama administration said a, a, a good deal of land is going to be subject to the Antiquities Act. The Trump administration walked that back. And now do you expect President Biden to walk that forward again? Yeah, we expect, he, he's all but announced that he's going to at least return it to the Obama status quo. Mm-hmm. Um, We've heard indications that he also intends to expand Bears Ears by another seven, eight hundred thousand acres. Um, that that's what we've heard. I, I haven't gotten that confirmed yet. We don't know, um, but I think that's that's fairly likely. And I think it's fairly likely we're going to see more um, more monument designations, especially on waters as well. We saw yeah. we saw that recently in the Obama administration as an attempt to to end offshore offshore drilling. Uh, I think we're going to and fishing and fishing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we do have one question that I'll get to in a few minutes. If you have a question, please definitely submit it in the uh, Q&A box. Cody, let's move to the Second Amendment. You know, we've seen the first 100 days, definitely seen some worrying indications. What are you anticipating over the next three plus years? Yeah, I think we're going to see, uh, I think we're going to see much of the same for the first year of the administration. I think you're going to see them marshalling the administrative state, reinterpreting um, rules, reinterpreting the definition of rifle, short-barreled rifle, machine gun, firearm. They're going to spend a lot of time looking at those. And I think that's going to be our first year. It's going to be through redefinition rather than legislation, yes. new regulation. Well, let me ask you why that is. Why why not legislation? Uh, it's easier. It's, it's easier for the administration to tell the ATF who it's appointing and to tell the Department of Justice who they've already appointed Garland as the head. And there's a certain current nominee for the head of the ATF that I won't even bother discussing because everybody is well aware of the the gentleman's uh, record as well as his long tenure with Giffords, which is an organization that is very much against individual firearm ownership. So you've got uh, almost clearly partisan individuals being appointed to the head of these agencies who are then controlling the rulemaking process. So they get to say what the rules are. And if they want to reinterpret firearm to mean a block of aluminum, then they're going to reinterpret firearm to mean a block of aluminum. And it's easier than trying to go through Congress where they have to go through the floor. They might have to you know, deal with the filibuster, which is going to be very problematic for a lot of policy points in the Senate. Um, so I think you're going to see that. It's simpler. It's just easier. And then when those are, are challenged, when we go to court on those issues, a lot of courts, you know, we've, we've worn away at this for the past few years, but courts give deference to agencies' interpretation of rules and regulations. So um, if the ATF says that a machine gun must be interpreted like this, then the court is going to start off with the assumption that the ATF wins. And then you have to 
overcome that assumption essentially. Mm -hmm. So it makes it not only easier for them to push these things through, but it makes it a lot harder for them to be challenged in courts. So that's, I think is going to, what you're going to see is your first year. You're also seeing Congress start to move more tangential gun bills through. So there's a couple of bills in the Senate, in the federal Senate right now, dealing with universal background checks, um, so-called universal background checks, as well as the, the waiting period. Mm-hmm. So right now on a background check, if it takes longer than three days for the background check to, to come through, then the retailer can transfer the firearm without a conclusive result. And that was designed as a protection against intentional government delay, which we see in so like in the oil and gas context. Which, this is actually an interesting thing. I think it's sort of backdoor regulation. I think we're also going to see a lot more. Exactly. So if you have to wait for this conclusive background check to come through and there's no time period attached to it, then they can just stop pushing the background checks through and then you can't transfer a firearm. Well, didn't we see that this was a major issue that came through last year with the pandemic? Yes. It's, it seemed the great excuse. Well, well, it's, we don't, we can't have people in the building. So we're there, no one to process your application. Exactly. Sorry, no one gets to exercise their rights this year. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's, it's this idea of, you know, regulation through just non-action. Yeah. Which we see in, we're going to see in gun cases coming up. We've seen in oil and gas cases, our Solonex cases like that. We have a couple of cases. Yeah. Decades. Yeah. Refu- refusing to act for decades. I think that's something that's going to be more and more common is if you don't have the popular support to create a new regulation, you just tell your employees to stop processing applications and no one gets what they want. Yeah. So I think that's what you're going to see to start. What you're going to see next year is going to depend a lot on, obviously, they're going to be looking at the, the, the midterms or the, the 2022 election. And depending on what how the polling is there might change how aggressive they are with executive order or with legislation. Um, I think that's when you'll start to see the administration stretch its legs on the idea of actual um, bans, actual prohibitions via executive order potentially. So I think those might take a minute, um, but that doesn't mean they're not coming. Well, let me ask you about the future of the Second Amendment rights, because... Second Amendment protected rights? Yeah, thank you. Because the Second Amendment only codifies pre-existing yeah. rights that existed before <laughs> the country. Thank you. So we had the Heller case and the McDonald case. Those were over a decade ago mm-hmm. now. Uh, and some of the things that you're talking about seem to implicate the rights that Americans have um, that are protected by the Second Amendment. Uh, what is the case law like and what sort of challenges could go forward to the types of actions that you're discussing? Yeah, so it's been a a tumultuous world since Heller was decided in 2008, McDonald in 2010. And those were the the Supreme Court's first real foray into the world of Second Amendment um, jurisprudence. And Scalia, in his Heller opinion in 2008, writing for the court, said you know, we don't we don't intend to fully flesh out the world of Second Amendment um, law jurisprudence at this time. It was a a roadmap and a decision in that instance. And since 2008 2010, you've seen no state follow that roadmap. Right. Almost no circuit follows that roadmap. But we've started to see them to consider originalism. Consider this idea that the Constitution has to be interpreted as it was meant when it was written, drafted, and ratified. Written and drafted are kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But even though they're not using necessarily the correct test that was established in Heller, they are starting to take into account original regulations and original rules. So we're trending in the right direction there, even though it's been a long time to trend in a right direction as opposed to just actually enforcing the, the Supreme Court's test as it should. There is a case... So is that is that you endorsing the Souter dissent, uh, Heller? Ooh, <laughs> it's it's, it's, yeah. it's an originalist dissent, Cody. Uh, it's bad originalism. <laughs> it's easy to take original regulation and to take original law and just bend it to what you want to do. The Ninth Circuit recently did this in a case um, in Young v. Hawaii. I wrote an op-ed about it uh, that was featured in Legal Insurrection. And basically the Ninth Circuit goes, well, because the federal government could prohibit minorities from owning arms, then that tells you that the federal government can prohibit people from owning arms. Instead of looking at it as an obvious equal protection violation that right. they you can't prohibit a certain class of individuals from possessing firearms, mm-hmm. the Ninth Circuit went, well, that says that we could do prohibitions if we want to. So you're, you bad originalism exists right. for sure. Okay. But the Supreme Court just recently granted cert in a case, uh, the second iteration, a new case from New York 
State Rifle and Pistol Association. And this is a, a firearm carry case. Now, last time they granted certain one of these cases, it ended up getting mooted out. That was quite controversial. But this could be the Supreme Court's opportunity to really reiterate the Heller decision and really um, focus on. I know a lot of people are, are concerned and skeptical as they should be because Heller set the test and nobody followed the test. But it's one thing when you've got a single case setting a test that then courts are interpreting that. It's another thing when you've got a second case employing that same test and affirmatively stating to the circuits that this is how they need to do it. And I think if that is the, the route the Supreme Court goes, it will change the way that litigation um, moves in this country. But even so, I mean, there are circuits that are upholding individuals' rights. There are circuits that are appropriately interpreting the Second Amendment. So even if this case doesn't pan out perfectly, even if this case doesn't come out uh, necessarily the, the way that we think it might, then we still have avenues and there are still ways to protect individuals' rights. There have been plenty of wins in the gun rights movement in the past 12 years, 13 years, and those will definitely continue. Move um, to Texas then? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody to move anywhere. <laughs> I feel like that's just a way of people. Are, then people are like, no, I don't want to. And then the people there are like, no, don't tell people to move here. So, uh, you know, people can vote with their feet as they wish. <laughs> let, me, let me turn to some of the uh, questions that we've gotten. So uh, if you have a question that you haven't yet submitted, please do so. We're going to take questions uh, for at least 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how many we get. Uh, so now is the time. So the first question is about COVID. Uh, I think I think it's fair to say COVID is sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, certainly affected the. Hopefully, it's not in the room right now. Well, I don't know. I I had it, so maybe it's in the room. But uh, <laughs> so here we are after 100 days of the Biden administration. You know, I think the conventional wisdom is that part of Biden's election came from seeing a lot of the difficulties that the country faced last year. But now things are, again, conventional wisdom improving. Uh, people are vaccinating, states are opening up. Where do you see um, COVID affecting mountain states? Um, and Cody, I think I'm gonna address this because, or I'm gonna direct this to you because of the New Mexico uh, case that you handled last year. Yeah, so we, uh, we litigated over the COVID issue in a second amendment case. Um, that was Aragon v. Grisham, where the governor of New Mexico closed down all firearm retailers, ranges, uh, training facilities. So we filed a lawsuit pretty soon after our lawsuit was filed, magically ranges and uh, stores were open again. But the key here will be how the administration proceeds. I think one of the, the things that we saw with COVID was that, I mean, obviously under the Trump administration, there wasn't a lot of federal mandates, um, more state-based. And you know, I think a lot of people now know who sit on their county health board. These are names that were probably previously unknown to individuals, but people are, are understanding the importance of, of, un, of knowing their local governance and knowing their local rules. I think that will continue. Um, it seems fairly unlikely that we get any sort of very broad, very heavy federal COVID regulation. I think those are going to present themselves in the funding conversation more, the government funds, then they're going to present in some sort of nationwide mask mandate. I, I just, it seems like that policy choice is pretty well off the table at this point. Now, if the federal government does move into those realms, right, that, that gives some interesting perspectives for potential challenges, depending on what those look like. But I think really for Mountain States com context, and I think David, you, you could probably address this a little better than I can, um, I think looking, taking a hard look at how the government is treating individuals and classes of individuals with funding is probably the, the, the biggest issue that we're seeing. Yeah, I would 100% agree. I think, I think we're unlikely to see significant changes in course as far as kind of national policy goes on a lot yeah. of things. Um, this, this is one aspect that Outside the however many trillions of dollars we're at now, uh, which seems so foreign that no one cares about that anymore. But out, outside <laughs> of the few trillion that I'm not sure would have been all that different under Trump, to be honest, yeah. um, I, I think it's it's mostly going to be left kind of the local and the state level, which, to be fair, not all have covered themselves in glory on this. Um, I think we're going to be seeing 
as far as we're going to get kind of controversy going forward, because now I think most of the the original class of cases have mostly died out by now, yeah. is we're going to be saying, yeah, it is, it's discriminatory funding, the the misuse of of uh, of emergency funds, um, the application of okay, public schools versus private schools, how that's going to apply. Uh, I, I think we're going to get a lot of kind of inequitable use and application of uh, relief funds, like you said, is going to be the and I yeah. Inequitable. Inequitable. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be the the primary issue going forward. Um, there, I think there, we're probably going to deal with some like non commandeering issues with the states. I think mm. we, I think we're still going to have some issues with that going forward as well. I'll bet about hopefully, that. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, we're not going to be getting any sort of national vaccine mandate or something like that. That could be on the table. I think that's probably a little too controversial for Biden to try to do. But yeah, we'll have to see. All right, well, we have another question. Uh, again, if you have a question, go ahead and submit it now. So some people are saying that the Democratic administration is interested in packing the court. Mm. Uh, and by that, uh, they mean adding justices to the Supreme Court. Uh, as we saw in the first 100 days of the Biden administration, the president announced ostensibly what is a blue ribbon commission that has a number of law professors, some on the right, but mostly on the left, uh, inquiring about what sort of uh, changes, although it's described as reforms, quote unquote reforms, can be made to the Supreme Court. Um, this is essentially in response to President Trump having three Supreme Court uh, justices and having six uh, Republican appointees on the court now to only three Democratic appointees. Uh, first question to both of you, whoever wants to take it, what do you think the likelihood of that is? And number two, is there anything that could be done to prevent it if uh, it looked like it were gaining steam? So either one of you. I actually think it's fairly unlikely. Yeah. Uh, I, the Every indication, Biden, whenever he's been asked about it, has been kind of somewhere between no and please, dear God, stop asking me this question. <laughs> um, his Blue Ribbon Committee kind of unique amongst his appointments and nominations uh, for his actual, the actual positions administration has actually been uh, not completely bipartisan, no, it's, but it's fairly bipartisan, fairly centrist. Yeah. It, it looks like if I were creating a blue ribbon commission for the purpose of uh, giving me cover to say, I'm not going to pack the court. That's exactly what the commission would look like to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think, all bets are off the second we get a controversial 5-4-6-3 Supreme Court decision. But as of right now, I don't see a whole lot of appetite from Biden. And I think he's going to just kind of try to wait this one out. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, one of my professors from USD is actually on the commission, uh, who is very much an originalist. Um, I think it's unlikely. I, in the non-legal realm, it might be a political suicide pill, pill at this point. There's just so much controversy surrounding it and so many issues that people would have to sacrifice their careers to get it through. And uh, I don't know how many people are willing to do that these days on, you know, so I, I just don't see it coming up. But I think you're right. I think if there is a very controversial 5-4 opinion, and I think it would have to be a 5-4, I don't think a 6-3 would give the cover, even though there's some questions about a lot of people have had questions about where Chief Justice Roberts comes out on a lot of issues these days. I don't see that a 6-3 is a 6-3, even though it's mm -hmm. however they classify it. I think a controversial 5-4 opinion with Roberts uh, outside of the majority is what they're going to really push is would would give them any any form of bait. So I think you're right there. Um, Legally, I mean, the, the Constitution does not establish the size of the court. The Constitution establishes the – it has a minimum of one person, which is a chief justice. That's all that's mentioned in Article 3. Um, so it's a, a statutory issue that, that sets the size of the court, and that obviously changes the way that it would uh, – I saw an interesting argument come up about whether or not it's a, uh, a proper – so under the necessary and proper role of Congress, whether or not it's a proper role of Congress mm – -hmm to influence the judiciary, which is some really kind of cutting edge. We don't need to get into that today. But Well, so you mentioned that. I think I agree with that take, or at least I agree with the broader take that expanding the Supreme Court for political purposes is troubling and problematic and maybe unconstitutional. So I just noticed in the last week, week and a half, some of the proponents of court packing have said, 
you know, it's not because of Barrett and um, Gorsuch. Yeah. It's because there are 13 circuits and we need a justice for every circuit uh, oh. to try to take it away from the realm of the political and to say, well, we have 13 appellate courts throughout the country. So wouldn't it be better if we had 13 justices, one for every appellate? Court? I mean, if they were We're, making that argument when the 13th circuit was created, I, that'd be one thing, but they're. Well, and would those same people be okay with a delayed appointment system? Right. So right. Uh, a democratic administration could appoint to the a Republican administration can appoint to, to then fill out the court. Did I do my math right? Four more? Yeah, there you okay, go. Good. Yep. Woo! <laughs> Lawyer, not a mathematician. Um, I That's a really interesting position. And if they were putting in a clause to ensure that it wasn't some sort of packing, then that might be an interesting expansion of the court. But I would be shocked if there's some, any sort of carve out for another administration getting to appoint the justices. No, of course not. Yeah. I think you'd be, yeah, yeah you, you, I think... You, you, you'd you be more likely to get some sort of compromise on sort of 12-year, 18-year terms or something. That would require an amendment, though. I think that's yeah. still fairly unlikely. I think the actual, um, to provide more of a, maybe a helpful answer on this one, in, the, in this area. Saying? <laughs> <laughs> but is, well, it, as far as people who are concerned about court packing, I think what we are, what was far more likely to see would be uh, an expansion of the circuit courts, uh, a splitting of the Ninth Circuit, uh, or maybe in adding more additional circuits, because that's a an honest to God problem that everyone on both sides of the aisle admits that we don't have enough circuit court of appeal yeah. judges. We don't have enough district court judges. There's just not enough judges. People are waiting six months, a year, 18 months. Average time of decision in the ninth circuit is 18 months. Right. So like, that's an actual problem that all of us can kind of agree on. So the solution is, okay, how do you solve this? Because um, if you do it like we did in the 70s with Jimmy Carter, uh, did the split the fifth into the fifth and the 11th, he got dozens of appointments, some mm -hmm. of whom are still on the bench. Yeah. Um, that's the sort that's the sort of thing that would be completely unthinkable today. You're you would that dead yeah. letter. So if Congress can kind of come up with some sort of compromise on how to do that going forward, I think we might see movement there or I think you might see uh, some effort from Biden and the Democrats to expand the lower courts just because they think that might be slightly less electrified, that rail. Yeah. I do want to get to our next question. Yep. Uh, so the next question is about the Americans for Prosperity case, which uh, is pending before the Supreme Court right now. Uh, oral argument was heard, I believe, early last week. Uh, this is an interesting case about California asking Americans for Prosperity to disclose its donors as a 501c3. Americans for Prosperity challenged the uh, request and a host of interesting groups have supported Americans for Prosperity, which is traditionally thought of as a more right-wing organization, including groups like the ACLU uh, and a few other typically left-wing groups. PETA. Yeah, PETA, PETA. right? So uh, do either of you want to talk or comment on the Americans for Prosperity case in the context of what the Biden administration has done or uh, any other aspect of the case, perhaps um, whether Senator Whitehouse uh, his, and his concerns about dark money are at play in, in the case? Yeah. So Mountain States filed a brief in this case or joined, joined a brief uh, yes. on this issue which you can also view on our website at mslegal.org. But the, the thing here is California is very obviously violating federal law. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a tax form that they're trying to require that lists organizations' major donors. The federal law indicates that that does not get provided in an unredacted form to the states, um, and California is asking for it anyway. So it's pretty straightforward. I think seeing the organizations that have come out in support of Americans for Prosperity, like Will was talking about, really shows just how damaging this policy is and how inappropriate it is. I mean, it's very rare that you see a such a block of individuals. I mean, ACLU, PETA, other more progressive organizations, and you've got some of the most um, conservative organizations as well, that are all making the same arguments. It's not even that they're all just supporting AFP. They're all making very similar arguments. And I think that's a big indication. Um, now, what the Biden administration does with that, I mean, could there be a change in policy potentially? But again, that's not going to be favorable. The, the, 
a lot of the problems with what um, Senator Whitehouse has on this dark money, right, is that it's it's so clearly partisan. It's never focused on any organizations, but you know, Federalist Society and the, the organizations that he's concerned with. Kind of like the court packing issue, right? If if this was something that mul- like the sides could balance out, the the parties could balance out, it might be a different conversation. But everybody is almost uniformly opposed to this rule. So I I highly we'll see what the Supreme Court says. Um, you know, I think you you reviewed the arguments, David, and you watched our arguments, so you can kind of talk a little bit more about what what the Supreme Court has already kind of uh, indicated. But it seems highly unlikely to me that this is upheld or that this expands even under the Biden administration, because there's a lot of organizations that are supporters of the Biden administration that are strongly opposed to this. Yeah, yeah. just very quickly, David, because we do have another question before we close. So yeah, just one quick thing is, is it's this case has been portrayed as sort of a left-right issue because it's the liberal state of California kind of against the conservative Americans for prosperity. And obviously that sells better for the media. But if you can see from the, the parties uh, supporting AFP, you realize like this isn't really a partisan issue. This is a government versus the people issue. All governments like having more information on activists who are doing things that are political and people who are doing things that are political want the government to stay out of their business. And yeah. I think that's that's a nonpartisan issue. <laughs> let's let's squeeze in another question because it does relate to some of the um, future work that Mount okay. Tates may be we'll involved in. Two sentences. So oh, yeah. uh, the question is, I heard that the Biden bailout, the COVID uh, 1.9 trillion bailout uh, includes funds specifically earmarked for non-white farmers and ranchers. How constitutional is this? How could they possibly get away with it? So David and I have actually been working up this issue. Uh, This is true. So the $1.9 trillion bailout bill does include a provision that uh, relates to socially disadvantaged farmers. And then if you look up the definition, it defines socially disadvantaged farmers in a way that looks like it excludes Caucasian farmers and ranchers, which, uh, as many of you are familiar with, uh, race discrimination is generally prohibited under the U.S. Constitution. So I will just leave the audience with the closing words of stay tuned. Uh, we are definitely very interested in that issue, and it fits with our core practice area of protecting equal protection of the laws. So with that, I want to remind everyone, you can visit our website at mslegal.org. There you can find many of the links that we've talked about in this program. We're very um, excited to have you join us. Thank you for all of your involvement in the Q&A. We're glad that you spent the last hour with us talking about the 100 days of havoc, the first 100 days of the Biden administration. And we look forward to seeing you again at a webinar in the future. And again, our website is mslegal.org. Thank you all. 